I think probably the best way to finish off 2018 is discussing my most anticipated game, and that is Cyberpunk 2077. Heading into 2019, I think we're going to start seeing and hearing more about this upcoming role-playing experience. Actually thinking about that, maybe that's an obvious thing to say. But in 2018, we really just got our first good look at the game, and in 2019, I expect the marketing to really ramp up, especially if the game is going to potentially release later in the year, or even in early 2020. But yeah, we have not talked about Cyberpunk 2077 in about a month. I've seen a lot of you guys asking when the next video would be coming, and I wanted to finish this year off going through and breaking down all the latest new information we have on the gameplay, open world, setting, activities, side content, and story of Cyberpunk 2077. Nonetheless, I will say, expect more frequent videos of Cyberpunk 2077 in 2019, and if you're looking forward to this title, consider subscribing because I will be covering everything, similar to what I did with Red Dead Redemption 2 before it was released just a few months ago. And don't forget to join my Discord for discussion on this upcoming game and other titles. So I want to start by discussing experts predicting when Cyberpunk 2077 will release. There's been a lot of debate for the longest time if this game would even launch this generation, but CD Projekt Red on multiple occasions has said their focus is getting the game out for the Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC. Actually, in an interview with Gaming Bolt that we'll be discussing more in a bit, that very question was asked to CD Projekt Red's level designer Miles Tost. Specifically, he was asked if this would be a cross-generation title, as that has been rumored for years, since we obviously know the PS5 and the next Xbox console are arriving right around 2020. Anyway, his response was, we're focused on releasing Cyberpunk 2077 on PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. Now, just recently, as reported by one of Poland's largest gaming websites, Gry Online, Brokerage House Vester DM predicted that Cyberpunk 2077 would be arriving late next year, saying, We're keeping to the estimation of a debut in quarter 4 2019, with sales of 19 million copies in quarter 4 alone, an income of about 525 million US dollars. For comparison, the sales of Red Dead Redemption 2 were at 725 million US dollars within the first three days after it shipped, 15 million copies within the first eight days and 17 million copies within the first 12 days. The game was released only on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One consoles. With that in mind, our forecasts for Cyberpunk 2077 seem very conservative. Remember that the game will come simultaneously both on PC and console. We also believe that the world of Cyberpunk slash sci-fi should be more popular among gamers than the subject of the Wild West. So this prediction has been what a lot of people have been talking about recently. I certainly agree that Cyberpunk 2077 could be massive in sales, and probably would attract more casual gamers with a sci-fi open world title, but these are just predictions, nothing official. Analysts have also been extremely wrong before. Games analyst Michael Pachter believed The Elder Scrolls VI was to be released in 2017, and well, well, I mean, he was wrong. Now, while I'm hopeful for a release late next year for Cyberpunk 2077, especially since CD Projekt Red announced their distribution partners earlier this year, I'm not 100% sold, and I definitely could see this as a spring 2020 release like The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt was. Most importantly, though, CD Projekt Red is taking their time, and there really is no rush. But I will say January 10th is an interesting day for Cyberpunk 2077, a day everyone should keep an eye on. The first teaser trailer was released on that day back in 2013, and last year we had the infamous beep tweet which was a sign to everyone that finally the marketing for the game was beginning. This year could we get a release day announcement, a new trailer, or some sort of tease? Anything is possible. And really with CD Projekt Red you gotta expect the unexpected from them. But something else that I did find interesting recently is that CD Projekt Red mentioned Red Dead Redemption 2. During CD Projekt Red's quarter 3 2018 financial call, CEO Adam Kaczynski stated, Without a doubt, quality is of paramount importance. We strive to publish games which are as refined as Red Dead Redemption 2 and recent Rockstar releases in general. That game is excellent, by the way. We are rooting for it. Rave reviews excellent sales. What does that teach us? Well, it teaches us that we need to publish extraordinary games, and that's exactly what we are planning. 
Every few years we have games like Red Dead Redemption 2 and even The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, and I truly feel the more unique and innovative the title, the higher the interest and anticipation. We saw that with The Witcher 3, Spider-Man, God of War, Red Dead, and you could even make a case for Fortnite. Word of mouth, reputation, and quality is extremely important in the gaming industry, and that's why analysts believe Cyberpunk 2077 could be a massive seller when it arrives. Now, Adam Kaczynski would further confirm in the QA section of the call that Cyberpunk 2077 is indeed playable start to finish. He specifically confirmed a report that came about during Gamescom, but he did add, We are fleshing out the game world. The comment regarding the game's campaign, yes, it was true at the time it appeared. However, not all of the game looked like the fragments showcased at E3 and Gamescom. A large part was not quite as detailed. We are filling the world with content and tweaking things, and this involves a great deal of hard work on the part of developers. What I can say today is that we're progressing fast and according to plan, when we finish, there's also the hugely important phase of polishing all that game content. There was a question about the quality of the game we plan to deliver at launch, and our intention is to deliver something of great quality. Once the game is complete, we can begin to patch various bugs, both major and minor, and we are setting aside time to complete this process. So yeah, the game is playable start to finish, but that does not mean there is not a ton of work to be done to get the game running, looking, sounding, and feeling the best it can be. But just from this statement, it sounds like things are progressing on schedule. Cyberpunk 2077 has not had the easiest development, so this is encouraging news. But let's move on to actual gameplay details that have come about recently, and we'll begin with a question questions Cyberpunk 2077's Twitter and Facebook accounts have been answering. First, the Twitter account confirmed a few things. There will indeed be a photo mode, which should not be a surprise to anyone. It seems to be becoming a more common feature in gaming. But they were also asked if there would be a playable demo for the game, and they stated we have no such plans, which again, not really a surprise. If there was a multiplayer mode, maybe this would have made more sense. But being that this is a single player game at launch, I don't think there is a need for it. Next, they would be asked what type of vehicles will we see, and their response was, for now, the only way of traversing the city we can confirm is that, aside from traveling on foot, players will be able to use an array of cars and motorcycles. For a while, there's been a big question mark surrounding flying vehicles or planes, something that CD Projekt Red has vocally stated they're not sure if they can get in the game, as they've had difficulty implementing the feature. This response, though, I will say is written in a way that makes it seem that they could be still trying to figure a way to make this possible. But now, heading over to Facebook, we have some more in-depth responses to questions regarding gameplay and story. First, we have someone asking if we can join slash side with corporations or factions, and CD Projekt Red's reply is, Since cyberpunks value freedom the most, you'll be able to work for many factions, but you won't ever want to permanently join them. My thinking is that while we won't have to or want to permanently work only for, say, Militech, there will be points in the story that we will have to side with one or the other. So yeah, we will have the freedom to choose, but there will be a time likely later in the game that working for or with a faction may no longer be possible. I actually do wonder if this game will involve another corporate war, which, you know, factions could be knocked off that way. That's just something I've been thinking about. Anyway, it would be pretty cool if we end up having the possibility for complete freedom by the end, similar to Fallout New Vegas, in which we don't have to even side with any faction to finish the game. But that's just a small dose of speculation and wishful thinking. Anyway, the next question answered is on the hacking mechanic, in which CDPR states, Netrunning will definitely be an important part of the game, but I can't tell you much about it. What I can say is that gameplay wise, you'll be able to hack systems to help you during missions, open doors, distract enemies, etc. You'll also be able to gain knowledge that you will use to your advantage, locations of interesting places, and so on. Not a real surprise with how hacking works, but the most notable detail is that you can use hacking to gain knowledge of interesting locations, which I imagine hacking certain devices could give intel on locations, full of useful equipment and weapons, as well as valuable loot. But finally, to our last Facebook question, this one is about the size of Night City, and CDPR's response is, Night City holds six districts, but I can't give you an exact number in square meters because no one counted this yet. Also, this is tricky for an urban environment. Night City has lots of buildings, and these buildings have floors. You can have 120 square meters of space, technically, taking up 60 M2 of space, and a tall building, and we will have many of them explorable. Each floor can house a lot of activities. Floors stack. The Witcher was, in a way, 
way much flatter. The activities were scattered. Here, the world can be huge, but it can be huge upwards or downwards. This response is actually my favorite because we know there will be some sort of mission in space that was teased in the E3 trailer and leaked even before then. But there's also been rumors of black market shops being located underground. Either way, what I loved about The Witcher 3 was that there were so many houses and places you could enter into and explore or loot. That seems to be again the case with Cyberpunk 2077, but there is an emphasis on Night City being much more vertical than The Witcher 3. In some other news related to those working on Cyberpunk 2077, earlier on in December, Kyle Rowley, the associate design director of the game, announced his departure from the studio, saying he was moving back to Finland and rejoining Remedy Games to work on Control. He did announce his departure on Twitter and said that Cyberpunk 2077 would be killer. Additionally, it was also just days later announced that Rhyme's lead level designer, Manuel Mandeluz, would be joining CD Projekt Red and working on Cyberpunk 2077. But to the final part of this video, I wanted to go over some of the recent interviews done by CD Projekt Red developers discussing Cyberpunk 2077. First, we have one coming from PC Gamer who visited the studio's Warsaw headquarters and got to see the gameplay demo again and talk to some of the developers. Writer Stanislaw Swichiski, I probably bombed the name, my pronunciations always fail, well he started off by discussing the world they are trying to build. He would say, we wanted to give Night City a Californian feel. It's not just another abstract dystopia. I visited LA for the first time this year and it's very inspiring, especially walking along Venice Beach. We want to bring some of that vibe to the game, the sun, the palm trees, but a darker side too. It's an incredibly diverse place with all these different people, fashions, and cultures sharing the same space, but it can also be dangerous. He then proceeded to give more background on some of the districts, saying Watson is a multicultural district with a strong Asian influence and a rising crime problem. But there are other districts too, each with their own unique feel. Westbrook is where the middle classes live, Haywood was once home to the tech giants but abandoned and left to rot, and Pacifica is a suburban district ruled by gangs in the most dangerous place in the city. Whenever you are in the city, there's a layer of darkness. Masige Pietras, lead cinematic animator, would next give insight into how they are improving facial animations, saying we also changed the way we do facial animation. Moving to a new muscle-based system, we have a huge library of facial animations which I think is important in a first-person game. You can get close to people now, and this new tech lets us pick out more subtle details in the faces. When you first see a street vendor, he'll be trying to sell you something, calling you over to look at his food, and you should be able to see enthusiasm in his face as well as his body language. I will say that facial animations are very important with any role-playing game or really any story game. We've seen some games fail terribly because of just that, and others like Red Dead Redemption 2 have created such emotional, powerful storytelling and dialogue through these animations. But through most of this interview, the CD Projekt Red team makes clear that the story comes first, and they want to deliver an emotional experience impacted by every decision and choice that we make. Patrick Mills, quest designer, would explain some of the quests and content that they are trying to implement, saying, Having a setting with telecommunications makes all the difference. It's also more immersive. How do you get a quest in the real world? Usually it's a phone call or a text message. Can you go pick up groceries? Our open world team is constantly filling the city with little events that can feed into quests. You'll see some dudes on the street and eavesdropping might lead to a quest. Or maybe because you talk to them, you might see them a couple of hours later in another quest and get some reactivity there. There. And lastly, Mills would explain some more details on the types of quests we should expect, saying, I wish I could give examples, but one of the things I most enjoy is creating quests that fully subvert your expectations. One of my favorite encounters I designed for The Witcher 3 was being approached by a taxman, which triggered if you were carrying a lot of coin. He shows up and asks you where you got all of your money and calculates how much tax you owe. These are the kinds of things that flesh the world out, and I want to do something similar in Cyberpunk. This is not just a world where people people are shooting each other all the time. Yeah, you're a mercenary, so your job is shooting people, but you'll have other things to do as well that are very different. A lot of games have struggled with mission and quest design. Many becoming too repetitive with quests like shooting up a location and moving on. Those are boring. The Witcher 3, though, had some phenomenal side stories that likely many players never experienced. Like, for example, I believe in the Blood and Wine DLC, Geralt learns that someone set up a bank account for him because he completed a contract years ago in the end 
individual did not have a chance to repay him, so instead they went to their local bank and set up an account in Geralt's name with the money that was owed to him, pretty much ensuring one day Geralt gets paid. But once you actually get to the bank, it turns into this whole bizarre situation with tons of hula hoops, but the thing is, it felt unique and different, which is one of the many reasons why I love The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, and it sounds like we'll see more of that in Cyberpunk 2077. But to the last interview, I want to briefly go over is the one coming from Gaming Bolt, in which they interviewed CD Projekt Red level designer Miles Tost. We discussed some of his remarks on Cyberpunk 2077 earlier in this video and in my last video, in which he stated this would not be like Grand Theft Auto, as they are striving for a different, story-driven experience, and additionally that the police would not be pushovers. Well, now we have the full interview that was released this month, and there are a few more interesting remarks he made that I wanted to bring up. Gaming Bolt would ask, Do you think the current gen consoles can pull off that kind of NPC count and the level of fidelity as seen in the demo? And his response was, Looking at the games released at the beginning of this generation and comparing them to some of the absolutely amazing looking recent titles, we can see quite an astonishing difference. Developers are a resourceful bunch. We figure out new and better ways of using and optimizing tools we work with all the time. The next question we have is, We saw hints of destructibility and environments during the demo. I know you've spoken about this a bit recently, and I understand that right now you may or may not have pinned this down, but is that something that you're looking to make a much larger part of the game? And his response was, we believe that having a world you can interact with and which reacts to your presence is a key part of a good open world experience. Dynamic environments ultimately serve to fulfill that promise exactly. They help to enhance your immersion, the game world to become more alive and believable. And what's especially important when it comes to Cyberpunk 2077, at a whole different level of weight and grid. Combat becomes that much more vicious too, enhancing the feeling of a world shrouded in violence and danger. Given all that, let me just say we're working hard on making sure that our environments look just as good when they're untouched as when they're getting blown up, without sacrificing the performance. And lastly, he was asked about their DLC plans for Cyberpunk 2077, if they even have any, and if they would be similar to The Witcher 3 Wild Hunts, and obviously he did not answer that question as their focus is on the base game right now. But we discussed a ton of new information on the gameplay, story, setting, and other aspects of Cyberpunk 2077, I stated earlier that I definitely feel there could be something coming soon from CD Projekt Red on Cyberpunk 2077. If this game is launching late this year, in the next few months we should expect to hear news on the release date. Personally, I'm still thinking early 2020 and maybe an announcement of a specific date at E3 2019, but it's hard to say right now, as it's unclear how completed this game is. Anyway, just recently for the holiday, CD Projekt Red released a holiday-themed tweet saying, as usual, it's coming when it's ready. I'm certain CD Projekt Red will take their time to make sure the game is polished and ready to go whenever it does release. There is no rush. Anyway, even though I have some doubts of a 2019 release, I still have my fingers crossed. But what do you guys and gals think of all the news and information that we discussed today? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. But thank you for watching, make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this video or found any informative value, and consider subscribing for more videos like this, and I'll see you later.